Check out options for paving stones. Inside of that is a simple hole to replace a sewer line. And now it's grown to going all the way across the street, replacing storm, sewer, and water. This is going so well. <laughs> what happened to all this plumbing here? I've never seen anything like this before. There's already rot going on in that trunk. So what have you found up here? Well, a bit of a surprise. It's really the classic plumber's lament. Nice. See this main roof form? We're going to pull that forward so it's even where this existing deck is. Definitely says mid-century modern. The money's in the details. That is beautiful. Hi there, I'm Kevin O'Connor and welcome back to this old house here in Brookline, Massachusetts, where we're about halfway done with the renovation of our 1957 mid-century modern home. And out here in the front of the house, you can see the scale of the additions. Off to the right, we've got mostly new bedroom space. The original house in the middle is very obvious. And then off to the left, we have got what's going to be mostly new living space. Now, while this was the original front of the house, we're actually going to flip that equation, put it on the other side, and there is a lot of work to do over there. Underneath the new living space of this addition is a garage. And that means that right here, there will be a driveway. And this is obviously hardscaping. And it's just one piece of the hardscaping that we have to figure out on this side of the house. We'll also have to deal with a retaining wall, uh, a new walkway, and a couple flights of steps up to the new front entrance, as well as a patio all the way back there. Some of them are going to need to be heated, others not. Some of them are going to need to be porous, some not. And so Jen Nawada has taken our homeowners and their landscape architects on a shopping spree to try to figure all of this out. Hi guys. Hi. Hi. Hi Jen. Hi Jen. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. So we're here to look at many different materials for many different spaces. Is that right? So we have a couple of different areas. Uh, we need to pick pavers for the driveway, um, pavers for our patio, a uh, couple of retaining walls, and am I forgetting something? And, and the steps going from the patio around the back of the house, right? Yep. So stones yeah. for that too. Okay. So and so, what kind of feel? What kind of look are we going for? What kind of style? So Jen, it's a modern house, right? So um, we're going to try and match the modern aesthetics. I think we're going to use a lot of gray, um, a lot of concrete, um, you know, square lines, uh, rectangular blocks. And if it's really made of concrete, I think we're going to keep the look of concrete rather than try to match or mimic like a natural stone house. Yeah. I like that idea. So yeah. like, and then that will just unify the space. Does that along with your design aesthetics for the plan? Yeah, it does. And actually, it's been very interesting because usually New England, you think about stone. Mm -hmm. Everybody has stone. And the opportunity to use these modern materials doesn't come along very often. Yeah. So, all right. Well, let's get started. What do you want to look at first? Let's start with the walls. I think they're over here. Okay. Okay. So there's a number of different products that we look at. So these are precast concrete blocks, as you can see. And I think this is actually a stone coping. And they all kind of placed together like this and it can create the wall that we need, which only needs to be about 18 inches high there at the patio. Okay. I, mean, I, like, the, I like the color combination. I like the grays and a little darker band. Uh, I, I mean, I don't think I'm uh, in love it's, with it's, the rough edges, right? Yeah, it's not clean enough for us, I think. Uh, it's yeah. not that modern look that you're going for. Yes, exactly. Think, yeah, the colors are right, but the finish is not. All right. All right. Well, I think they have a couple of other ones we can look at. Let's check it. Okay, okay this is another product. I think you might like a lot better. You can see it as a much more neat and clean finish, much more modern in my mind. I really think it's going to fit the character and style of your house and what you're going for. What do you think? Yeah, it almost reminds me of the house, you know. <laughs> I think it'll be a good fit, especially I see the clean lines, I see a more homogeneous, you know, gray surface. I see a few color variations. I see a little bit of brown in those stones out there, but I think I think we like the, the yeah. more grayer, the, the bluer, the, co the cooler. Yeah, I, I agree. I think I like that better too. And maybe we can have an accent of the black that we saw on the other one. Yeah, I think so. And because your wall is going to be a little bit higher than this, so there'll be room for that accent band you talked about being sandwiched by those different rows of the concrete blocks. So is this going to be your selection or is it a strong contender? A strong contender for sure. Okay, <laughs> excellent. Well, let's go look at the patio surfaces. Good. 
Okay, so as you can see, there's lots of different kinds of patio uh, blocks that you can choose. I mean, there's this one, which is a fairly typical concrete block paver, but I'm not sure this is exactly what you want. Right, you want clean cut for modern. No, I agree. I think you guys know us well by now. Uh, <laughs> <I'm> Try. <laughs> right, and I think this might be a lot more what you're looking at, because as you can see, these blocks are, you know, they're very, they have a very neat, clean edge here. And you can see there's lots of different colors here, but you have you have a more uniform color if you wanted. And I think this would work really well in the patio. And another thing, this patio has to be a permeable surface. It's a re requirement from the town. So any paver we pick has to be able to be the permeable paver so water could travel through. Right. And then size-wise, is a size? Gray color, maybe. Yeah, no, I think that's the right choice. Okay, well, so over here are a few larger pavers. So these pavers would work. Uh, when you typically lay a patio, these nubs right here are the spacers uh, to appropriately space the pavers, but you need a permeable paver. And when I'm talking permeable, the surface is not permeable. Uh, the water's got to penetrate through the joints. So, Blair, do you have one of those spacers? So they have to be spaced differently. These are applied in between, and it gives a little bit wider joint, and it, you have to use a specific stone that doesn't wash away, and that will allow the water to penetrate through. Well, I think these would work. Yeah, like the that. Spacer, I think, if you can make it permeable, I guess the town will be happy, and we'll be keeping all the water on our property, so it'll be good for everybody. Absolutely. Excellent. So what's next? So the next thing we need to look at is the pavers for the driveway. And as you remember, since we have a heated driveway, we have a concrete slab, and then we need to mortar the pavers on top of that. And so the jointing you see here is really rather tight together, but you need to have a half inch joint to be able to get the mortar in to get these things neatly set on top of the, of the concrete. And you also want to think about pattern. Do you, do you want a running bone pattern? Do you want a herringbone pattern? Uh, I think I like the herringbone pattern better, but probably not in so many colors. Um, like a more uniform gray or black. Well, that would work nicely in terms of its application, mm -hmm. just keeping in mind about the jointing that we talked about. So should we go check out that step? Last thing so. on our last list. Last thing on the list, yeah, right. let's do it. Okay, so the last thing we need to think about is steps. And this type of material, which we saw on the concrete block wall out there, also comes in a step material that's about six inches high. And I think that would work just perfect for the transition from the patio that goes up and around the house. And also another thing to think about, the, the face. Do you want it to be thermal, clean cut, or do you want it to be a rock face, irregular edge? I think we prefer a clean cut for sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be fitting the overall aesthetic we've been talking about. Fantastic. All right, so this is great. We've seen a lot of great things today. You've made a couple great decisions. We need to make a few more because we got to get these orders placed and get moving because we have to get it installed in the ground. Good. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's do great. it. <laughs> Last week, Norm and Charlie framed for the skylights, but it was raining too hard so they couldn't put it in. So week we're gonna finish it up you guys framed up that opening it looks pretty good yeah we doubled up the rafters installed the timber hangers as needed yep just have to snap these lines all right so you got the holes already pre-drilled up in the corners the bottom and now the top okay that gives us an idea where it is now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut from the hole following this line at about 45 degrees and cut in to the center all right so this that rubber roof that we installed. Now we'll cut the other one out. Now we'll cut the other two. Connect it down the middle. Okay, now what we're gonna try to do is pick this up. I know it's stuck down with the glue, but we gotta be able to roll it back and up. Always tricky. This cement really holds well. The thing about this glue, it holds. Now we're actually pull this back, but we're actually going to have to cut a little further out 
to make room for the thickness of the curb. All right, that's loose. We gotta peel it back even more, but let's lay the curbing on there. Now, with this skylight, it actually requires that you build your own curve to sit it on. So line it up with the lines there. And because this is such a flat roof, we made the curbing out of two by eights. All right, so what I want to do is I want to mark the outside of the miter right here of this bevel piece. I like to put this bevel piece on the curve so when the rubber comes up, it doesn't have a real sharp 90. It will bring it up and then drop it on like that. All right, let's slide it up. What we're going to do is cut our corners a little bit deeper and peel back more rubber. underlayment is actually called an iso board which is an insulation and we don't need it in the opening obviously but when cutting it oversized a little bit we'll, we should be able to see what we're doing now we can see the structure okay now we're going to remove these two center boards right here so we can get some more accurate measurements for our rough opening get the boards out of the way and take our measurements space between the header here and this header right here in our curb and we've centered it in the opening at the top now we'll just screw it down to the roof to the touch, the contact vent is ready to go. And you only have one shot at it. We can't just take it and flip it up. We want to roll it into it gently because we don't want to get any bubbles. Push it in, push down at the same time. Just like that. Now we're going to bend it over and nail it. You don't want to have any slop in it. All right, now we're ready to start sealing up these corners. And we can't use this rubber here because when you stretch it, it will go back like a rubber band. So we're gonna use uncured rubber. When you stretch it, it stays stretched and we can bend it around the corner. So we're gonna just take this right here. This is an activator. And I'm gonna just paint it on the rubber and I can go a little beyond my lines. All right, you can see that it's starting to evaporate a little bit right now. So we'll start in the middle, we'll peel off this. Okay, so now I want to put this one right about halfway here. Where are we? Looks like about half right there. And I want to be up a little, and we can push that in. Bend it around, but I want to take this bottom piece off before we bend it. Okay, so now keep that up, and I'm going to force this right around the corner, stretching it as I go. Just like that. Push it right in. Okay, now we're going to force it down and keep it down to the curb and out, just like that. Stretch it. Pull it and push it at the same time. All right, now we have to put a bead of lap sealing on each one of the seams. That will give it added protection. Okay, so the manufacturer's not calling for this, but we're going to run a bead right across the top. 
and sit the window in that wet sealant. Just a little added protection. All right, let's get the unit, drop it on. Okay, we'll put it on there, center it. Beautiful. All right, check the center and we'll screw it off and that'll be watertight. Looks good. The storm and sewer lines come out of the basement, go underground to the street. And a few weeks ago, Richard took a camera, stuck them into the pipes, and Richard, you found all sorts of problems, which explains the industry we've got going here today. Right, we found rocks, we found rodents, and we found cracks, and now we have to replace all this line that's going out here. So our site contractor, David McLaughlin and his crew, yesterday opened up this trench, and we found a ton of stuff, so look at this. Uh, right here you can see the two lines that come out from the house. One is the sanitary sewer, that's the stuff that comes from the toilets and fixtures. And the other is the storm sewer, rainwater. Now we thought or assumed, like most houses, that it would have been that the storm went all the way to the storm main, which is out here in the street, and the sanitary went to the sanitary sewer. But they combined together as a Y right here, and they're all encased. And we, we found that the, the drain from this house came all the way over here and you looped over. That made up so we've got two things to fix. We can't run our gutter water into the sewer line. That's going to now go across right, the street. Right, right. And yeah, yeah, we've got right. their sewer line over right, there in the right, wrong right, spot. Right. Before they go any farther, they have to get clearance from the local inspector who's right here overseeing it. Jimmy's explaining what's going on. So who's responsible for all of this cost? I mean, there's a ton of stuff well, here that was unexpected. It depends on town to town, but in this town, it used to be that the town owned to 10 feet outside the house. Now the homeowner owns all the way to the sewer. So this is on the homeowner's dime. Yeah. It's an expensive hole. It is. Everyone here is pretty much seeing these conditions for the first time, trying to figure out right. what's the solution. Yeah. And what's going to last over time. This is going so well. <laughs> right. I don't think people realize how many things run under the street and how much activity happens with these utilities. I do now. You do. So let me show you a problem we have over here in the foundation. It's a crack in the wall that runs right down down and sort of all the way through. I mean, I can see six or eight inches of it right here through yeah. the whole foundation wall. And you'll probably see a hairline crack outside. So what do you think caused this? Well, think about it. When they poured this foundation, although it's 12 inches thick, it doesn't have a footing. Right. But also the drainage outside in the wintertime, the water runs down and it freezes against that foundation. And you know what happens with water when it expands. It pushes against the foundation, and this is just a little, little weak leak right here. All right, so I know you've got a plan to address the water. We're going to have much better drainage. You know, we're going we're gonna to address the water out there and solve that problem, and Hugo's going to fix the problem right here. All right, so what's the solution here? So what are you going to do here, Hugo? Well, Tom, we started off by first taking a grinder and giving this crack some depth so we can introduce the material a little better. Now, I noticed that when you ground this, you actually went like a V. Normally, I would think you would have straight uh, Correct. groove. So if it was something that we were tucking in cementitious, we would cut it straight. Because we're relying on epoxy and it's low viscosity, we know we're going to bond to the roughness of the concrete anyway. I see. Okay. So the next step that we did was after we ground this, we took some alcohol and just surface wiped the, sur the substrate. And then we're going to start off by applying these ports next. And what do these ports do for us? We're going to introduce the low viscosity resin through these that it goes into the crack. So you're injecting this epoxy into the crack Correct. for us? Correct. Yep. This will be surface mounted right here by using epoxy. It's funny, when I see this thing, I thought you had to drill holes in it and insert that in this way. Right. But you're going to mount it on the wall. That Correct. Way. Oh, that's pretty cool. We're going to rely on the epoxy to hold it in place. Okay. The only issue with today is the temperature. It's a little cold. Yeah, it is cold. So we're going to have to run a little heat. Kev, do you mind just turning that heater on for us? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So what Ryan's going to do now is he's going to butter up the back of these things and then he'll be able to surface apply right over that crack that you see there on the wall. Now I'm surprised that when you push that on the wall it doesn't block the hole for the other epoxy to go into. Correct. What they did, Tom, is when they designed these, as you can see in the back of it, they made the centerpiece so that it's protruded. 
It almost acts like a little dam to keep the epoxy from getting in I there. I see. So there's a little ridge that prevents it as it squish and it doesn't block exactly. that hole. That's exactly. pretty cool. So what he's doing now is he's using that fan tip to bridge across the opening, as you can see there. Oh, and it work his way right down the crack, Tom. Yeah. So this is acting like a little dam. Exactly. So he'll just tool that smooth and he'll switch over to the other material, which is a low viscosity, almost like water. And that's gonna act like you said, the tube that you see that he's using. So that's like an airline fitting to lock onto the gun. Exactly, where it locks right onto that port so that we know we're not gonna lose any material. So he just pushes that on? He pushes it right on, and if you tug on it, you can see that it locks oh, right into yeah, place. Oh yeah, see it moving. They'll keep him from losing any of that grout. And even though we can't see it, it's flowing into our cracks. It's flowing behind. into that cavity behind, correct. Oh, there it is. And there it is coming out at the top. We got some good back pressure, and at least it didn't lose out from the outside, as we can see here. So right. once you're done pumping it all in, and this crack fills up, how long for it to dry or set up? Before you remove anything off, we like to give it at least two days. Two days. Yes, so exactly. You, so after two days, you will remove the stuff on the front? Correct. We're going to take that right off, grind the substrate, so that when you look at it, it's aesthetically pleasing. So the big question is, is, how strong is your repair? It's very strong. I mean, typically concrete, what do you think this is? This wall, this is an old wall, could be 2,000, 2,500. But you got to remember, concrete continually ages and over time. So this might be almost 3,000. So if that's 3,000 PSI, what's your fix? So at seven days, you're about 6,500 PSI. At 28 days, you're, they're talking about 9,000 PSI. Your fix is three times stronger than a wall. Than a concrete. We're a good company. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's All a right. basic structure. There you go, Ryan. Thank hey, you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for guys. having us. A fix that's three times stronger than the original wall? I like that. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? It is. So what's coming up next time? Well, look behind us. We have eight different levels. And guess what? we got to build stairs for all of them. All right. Well, until then, I'm Kevin O'Connor. And I'm Tom Silva. To this old house. So we have a stair master. Oh, yeah. Up and down, up and down. Next time on This Old House, I'll give you a formula to make stairs easy to climb. Rise. Right. Run. Correct. We're heating this house from the ground up. Radiant floor heating. So this palm nailer is a real time saver. And these sheets of foam will give us insulation and studs for our foundation wall. Now I just find out where all my studs are. Again, they'll be 16 on center. Shoot it in with the drywall gun. more This Old House, go to pbs.org slash thisoldhouse, where you can watch full episodes anytime. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This Old House magazine, the companion to our television series, provides trusted information from our team of experts. You can use your credit card to subscribe for one year. That's six issues for $10. Just call 1-800-221-5900.